Welcome to the BPS Customs YouTube channel. I'm your host, Brian, and whether this is your first time joining us or if you are a longtime viewer, I definitely appreciate you stopping by and hope that you get some good information out of the next 20 minutes or so. If you've ever wondered what goes on inside of that mysterious black box under your desk, then you've come to the right place. This is our new series, Gaming PC Basics, where over our series of videos, we're gonna help you understand what goes into building a PC, what the individual components actually do, how to choose the right parts for your specific use case, and even how to build it and what to do afterwards. If that sounds good to you, make sure you click on that subscribe button down below and even follow me on Twitter for more updates. Our Gaming PC Basics series kicks off right now. Need a Windows or Office key but don't want to pay retail? MMORC.com has all the best deals and a sweet discount for BPS Customs viewers. Just head over to the site link below and enter code BAN35 for 35% off your order total, meaning you could snag Windows 10 Home for under 10 bucks. Fill out your email and place your order and then click the extract code button at the top of the page. From there, it's as easy as heading to your Windows activation settings and inputting your shiny new key. For more information, head to MMORC.com or check out the links below. For some people, buying a pre-built PC from a store and knowing that when they hit the power button, it's going to fire up is plenty for them. But you're here because you want to know more about what exactly is bubbling beneath the surface of your $1,000 purchase. Today we're going to go over what the components are that are involved in building a gaming PC, why they're important, and what they actually do. Let's start off with something that is probably the most obvious part of a gaming PC, and that's the case. Whether you have a budget, mid-range, or high-end build, a new or an old system, a PC or a Mac, you're gonna need a case of some kind. Cases typically come with a few basic features built in, meaning you shouldn't have to worry about adding these on later. Most of the time, you'll get the case itself, a power button, sometimes a reset also, a headphone jack, and some number of USB ports. A lot of cases also come with fans to help with ventilation, although, Counterintuitively, the more expensive the case, the less likely it is to provide you with this add-on. Cases are probably the component on the market with the most available manufacturers and choices. But the big names here are Corsair, Cooler Master, Lian Li, Fractal Design, Thermaltake, NZXT, and Fantex. The traditional color for a PC case was kind of a really boring beige, and if you had a beige box while you were a kid, you're in good company. But over the past 10 years, Black has become the new standard, with lots of companies also now offering white enclosures. Occasionally, you'll also find gray, but outside of those three, the pickings do get pretty slim. If you want a pink, red, or blue case, there might be a few limited choices out there. And if you're big into green, purple, or yellow, well, you might have to bust out the spray can. Probably the most important aspect of choosing a case is going to be the size. And there are three main form factors that you'll need to be familiar with and also remember for other component selection. An ATX case is your standard size tower. It holds a large motherboard, but also has mounting points for smaller boards as well. It can typically accommodate large graphics cards and power supplies and is the easiest to work in. However, it does take up the most desk or floor space and it is the heaviest. Mini ITX is the smallest and second most popular. These cases are usually not recommended for first time builders just looking to get their feet wet, but if you're up for a challenge, the basics are the same. They can hold small motherboards and some even require the use of smaller power supplies and most of the time have limited space for hard drives and accessories, but they are compact and they are portable, and when they're done right, they definitely are impressive. The middle child is micro ATX. As you'd imagine, the size is a nice middle ground. They can fit small or medium sized boards and usually also a standard power supply. Micro ATX is the least popular, however, and your options here are usually limited. Regardless of size, many modern PC cases come with a window, and recently that window has been made of glass. 
Some manufacturers also offer their cases with a solid side panel option, which is usually better for acoustics if you prefer a quiet build. Moving on to the more exciting stuff, let's talk silicon. A requirement for any PC is one of these, a CPU or central processing unit. The CPU is the brain of your system, telling everything else what to do and when to do it. It tells your hard drive when to retrieve a file. It tells your graphics card that it's time to go to work. It even tells your lighting when it's time to need more RGB. When it comes to CPUs, they basically only come in two flavors, Intel or AMD. We'll talk motherboards next, but just keep in mind that the things that change the most frequently in the PC industry are CPUs, and this will impact your motherboard choice. Every CPU has a corresponding socket that it will work in, and for the purposes of simplicity, let's just say that there is really only one socket that any given CPU will work with. When making your parts choices, make sure you know what socket your CPU needs and what socket your motherboard has or will have. CPUs are typically refreshed every year, getting faster or more efficient or increasing in cores, but don't feel pressured to keep up with the Joneses. A CPU will likely serve as a great gaming companion for five or six years, and there are plenty of 10-year-old chips that are still out there and still doing just fine. When it comes to your options, both AMD and Intel offer different tiers of products numbered three, five, seven, and nine. Intel uses the i nomenclature, so their processors are i3, i5, i7, or i9, while you'll see AMD processors listed as either Ryzen 3, Ryzen 5, Ryzen 7, and Ryzen 9, or R3, R5, R7, and R9. As the numbers get higher, you get more powerful, capable processors, but also a price that scales accordingly. Of course, it sounds good for you to say that you have the most expensive, most powerful CPU, but a lot of people go wrong when building a system by overspending on a CPU that isn't properly leveraged while gaming. Most gaming applications do not put a full load on the CPU, so you can often get away with a six or an eight core chip for a premium experience instead of going with a 10, 12, or 16 core monster. There's a lot to talk about in this topic, and we'll deep dive into it in a follow-up video. You will need a way to keep your CPU cool, however, and there are two general ways that this can be done. You can either cool with air, like this traditional tower air cooler, or with water like this all-in-one liquid cooler. There are a lot of options here, and we'll talk more about how to choose a cooler in a follow-up video. Air coolers use a contact point called a cold plate at the base that draws heat away from your CPU and up into things called heat pipes. The heat pipes then run up through a series of fins and air blows across the fins, dissipating the heat into your case where it can be exhausted. A water cooler has a similar contact area with the CPU, but instead of transferring the heat to a heat pipe system, it instead transfers it to water running across the top of that cold plate, and the water runs through the tubes to a radiator in a very similar manner to how a car radiator works. There are fans that then blow through the radiator, exhausting the heat from your case. Now, on to motherboards. These are like the nervous system of any PC. Everything plugs into it and it sends signals between components as appropriate. It also handles the power distribution inside of the system. Like we already talked about, motherboards come in sizes that correspond to the popular case form factors. There's a full size or ATX board, a medium size or micro ATX, and a small size or mini ITX. ATX boards are by nature able to fit more features, connectivity, and even cooling just due to their sheer size. You could have more USB connections, more fan headers, more expansion slots, and even more RGB features on an ATX board. And they can range in price from about $120 all the way up to $1,000. Mini ITX boards can also be quite pricey simply because of the engineering effort required to cram most of that same stuff onto a smaller PCB, but you'll only get two memory slots as opposed to four, meaning RAM capacity is lessened. Again, micro ATX boards fall somewhere in the middle, but because of the lower popularity, you do have far fewer options. As a positive, micro ATX boards are typically the cheapest of the three. And because of the flexibility of the smaller size, they can be used in either ATX or micro ATX cases. This is why you often see pre-built systems using micro ATX boards. Keep in mind though that the biggest constant on motherboards is that they all have a CPU socket and the CPU socket needs to match this guy. 
The current socket for AMD is AM4, while Intel's current socket is LGA1200. You'll note that the sockets themselves do look quite different. The AM4 socket has a bunch of plugs because there are pins on the CPU that slot into the holes. The LGA1200 socket has tiny pins in it that make contact with the pads on the underside of the CPU. For now, this makes it easy to identify an AMD or Intel motherboard, although this might change. We might as well talk next about the thing that all gamers are clamoring for, and that is a graphics card or a GPU. Graphics cards are the workhorse of any gaming PC and what most determines how well your rig will perform. Unlike when we talked about CPUs, spending more on your graphics card will absolutely get you better gaming performance, I guess with a few exceptions at the very high end of things. The graphics card actually does the deed of translating all the ones and zeros into an image on your screen, and they can get quite pricey. The most expensive consumer graphics cards can get up into the multiple thousands of dollars, but don't think that you need to spend that much to get a good experience. In fact, a lot of how your GPU will perform is tied to the resolution of your monitor that you want to play on. If your monitor resolution is 1080p, you can get away with spending far less than if you wanted to game at 4K and ultra settings. Like with CPUs, there are only two major players in the graphics card game, AMD and Nvidia, but unlike with CPUs, the interface does not change and hasn't in many years. This has held true since the introduction of the PCIe motherboard slot, which despite advancing in bandwidth is always backwards compatible. This is a great thing because if you have a five-year-old graphics card, it will slot in perfectly to a brand new motherboard. GPU refresh cycles happen about every two years with the most recent batch of releases happening in 2020. Graphics cards usually are a safe bet to buy on the used market as well if you want to save some money as they tend to age pretty slowly and don't see any significant degradation in performance over time as long as they are properly maintained. We're going to move on now to the place where your data is actually stored. Traditionally, hard drives have been used for this purpose and they are still a very prevalent thing to see today. Hard drives use a physical spinning disk inside of a metal housing, and because they've been around forever and technology and manufacturing have improved over time, this is often the cheapest way to get a large amount of storage space, measured most commonly in gigabytes or terabytes. A terabyte is 1,000 gigabytes, and a one terabyte hard drive is pretty cheap these days. It can store a lot of stuff. More recently though, solid state drives or SSDs have taken over due to their smaller size, better power efficiency, lack of moving parts, and especially their speed. SSDs are available in either a version that looks like a shrunken hard drive or in a tiny package resembling a stick of gum. But either way, they will be more expensive than a hard drive when measured in price per gigabyte. For example, a one terabyte hard drive can usually be found for well under $50, while a similarly sized SSD will run you $100 or more. SSDs can have speeds anywhere from five times to 80 times that of a traditional hard drive, so it's not hard to see why they are so popular. Anyone building a system these days should definitely have at least one small SSD to run the operating system, as this will give you faster boot times and a much more enjoyable experience. There is another kind of storage in your PC, however, but it's not something that people think about traditionally in the same vein as a hard drive. System memory, more commonly known as RAM, actually functions like a temporary cache for files or information that your PC needs immediate access to. For instance, when you boot Windows and then open a browser like Google Chrome, your PC will allocate some of your RAM to that task, keeping some of those files stored there instead of having to call back to the hard drive every time it needs something. RAM is incredibly fast, allowing access to information about 30 times faster than a traditional SSD, meaning that whatever is being held there can be quickly accessed by your CPU. The downside of RAM is that it's what's called volatile storage, meaning that as soon as you hit that power button, all the data in RAM clears, unlike what you put on your hard drive or your SSD. The current memory standard is called DDR4, or the fourth generation of double data rate. We'll dive more into this in our video exploring RAM, but by that time, DDR5 might be out and this will be an exciting time for system builders. 
You typically purchase system memory in sticks of either eight gigabytes or 16 gigabytes, and a standard configuration is either two or four sticks for a total of between 16 and 64 gigabytes of memory in a gaming PC. And lastly, let's talk power. Power supplies are probably the least sexy part of a gaming PC, but without them, you're not getting very far. As the name suggests, power supplies are what take power from the wall and bring it into the system through a series of cables routed to the various components. Power supplies come in a range of wattages from 400 up to 1600 and efficiency ratings that are universal using what's called the 80 plus standard. You'll see a label on most power supplies with the 80 plus logo and the efficiency is denoted by the color of that logo. From worst to best, you have white, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, and titanium. And as you go up, you get more efficient operation, but of course, higher cost. You can also get power supplies with all the cables attached or in what's called a modular configuration where you can choose which cables you need and plug them in accordingly. This does save on cable clutter later on. Power supplies also come in two main form factors, ATX and SFX. ATX is your standard size and SFX is your teeny tiny ones like this. Okay, that took longer than expected, but there's so much to talk about when it comes to PCs that if you dive into the hobby, you'll never not be learning something. I'm always taking in new information and I've been doing this for 25 years. Make sure that you get subscribed if you want to check out more in-depth conversations about these components, including buyer's guides and how-tos, which will be coming to the channel in the next few weeks or months. Thanks for watching everybody and happy gaming.